Check, check, check. Awesome. Come on, that's a sign of a growing church, y'all. Get some kids in the building and God does the rest. Well, hey, we're going to jump right into the Word today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you keep playing with me, Tommy. If you have your Bible, go with me to John chapter 20 today. John chapter 20. And uh, let me be the first to say, if you're new to our church, new to gospel, welcome. Glad you made it. Can we welcome all our first-time guests, y'all? Would you put your hands together? We're glad you made it in the building today. Uh, we are a brand new church. I think this is week 14 since we've launched. And God has just been up to something. Um, you know, we, me and my wife moved in town about a year and a half ago and moved from California. Just felt like God was doing something fresh and something new. And we love all the churches that are here. We're in great relationships with all the churches, but we just felt like there's, there's somebody not being reached. And our church has just been trying to make the gospel deep enough to change your life, but simple enough for you to understand and actually apply to your life. And so we're glad you took some time to join us today. We love the Bible here. You're going to find out right away. I'm a Jesus guy. Jesus has saved my soul. He's everything to me. And so I might get a little passionate when I talk about him, uh, but I just think if something's so good, how can you be quiet about it? Hello. If something is really like it's changed your life, why be silent? And so we believe that church is not a list of things to do and not do. Someone say amen. Church, church is about a person and encountering what he's done for us. And when I see Jesus for what he did, then it makes me want to live for him. Too often we're trying to force people to live for Jesus when they never even get a chance to see him. So at our church, we believe in showing you Jesus. We believe in encountering the true gospel and then allowing uh, God to do the rest in your life. So we're excited. John chapter 20, we're going to start in verse number 19 today. And we've been in a three-week collection of messages on John chapter 20. So we've been dealing just with this chapter for the last three weeks. Uh, we celebrated Easter last week. It was awesome. We talked about resurrection and dead people raising from the dead. And today we're going to continue in that story in verse 19. Chapter 20 starting in verse 19. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. If you need a second, say, give me a second. All right, everybody's ready. Here reads the word of the Lord. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, this is the day that Jesus raised from the dead, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So just to bring you back in the text, remember, Jesus is the Messiah. He is, he's making these claims about who he is his whole life. He's telling the average person, I am God in the flesh. He told a bunch of fishermen, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He's been doing miracles. He's been doing signs and wonders, but no one really wanted him to die. We pick it up in the tenseness of the moment that he is gone. His disciples are locked away in a room because they're afraid that they're next. And he said that he would die, but they're still trying to figure out what actually happened. And it says in verse 19, the doors were locked where the disciples were. And Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw him. And Jesus said again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so am I sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. I want to title this message today, the revealed Jesus. Final talk of our collection of messages, the revealed Jesus. Uh, would you just pray with me one more time before we jump into this word? Father, thank you. Thank you for all our new friends in the building today. Thank you for the new life that you're already moving in this place. Lord, I pray for the next few moments that you would give us an, a heart to understand and a mind to perceive what you're actually saying. We don't want a good motivational speech. We don't want just something to make us feel better. We need an encounter with you. So we love you in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, say amen, amen. Turn to someone and say, you're going to get a revelation today. You're going to get a revelation today. I have a confession to make, ladies and gentlemen. I love Chick-fil-A. There's just something about the craving for Chick-fil-A when it comes on my life. I call it the spirit of Chick-fil-A. I'm just kidding. But there was this day where Andy and I were hanging out one day, and I just had this craving for Chick-fil-A. just had this thing in me that's like, we got to go get some Chick-fil-A. And you know that when you have a craving, there's something about just dropping what you're doing, getting in the car, and going. You know, so we just dropped it all, jumped in the car, put the baby in the car, drive up to Chick-fil-A, and just go and just satisfy that craving. 
Uh, for some of you, it might be some other food. It might be some other taste or something that you just have that feeling and you're like, I have to, I have to satisfy this craving. Can I tell you that God has a craving too? The Bible says in John chapter 4 that God is looking for worshipers. It says he's searching for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. When I first met Jesus, I never really saw that as something he was interested in. I thought that church was all about what I could do for him. But then I started to recognize that God actually wanted to do something in me and then through me. And Christianity becomes boring when you just let God do something to you, but it never goes through you. Christianity becomes a bless me club and a, and a museum of spiritual achievements when it's just about what he does to me, but it's not about what he does through me. I'm preaching already. Sometimes we get so focused on what he's doing in us that we forget he wants to do something in us for something else. People getting baptized today, 15 people that made that decision, they are washing away the old life and then they are coming up in a new life and saying, I'm ready for what's next. When I first encountered Jesus, I was searching for something. You ever been searching for something? Searching for meaning, searching for love, searching for acceptance, searching for understanding, searching for someone to just accept you and just love you. You ever been on a search before? What I noticed when I first encountered Jesus is I met him, encountered the true gospel, heard about the goodness of God, and all of a sudden the search was over. I had found what my soul was always looking for. But just because the search was over doesn't mean that the pursuit was over. Because when we get saved, the search ends. We find meaning again. But when we pursue God, that's when we find purpose. That's when our life makes sense. That's, why, that's when we're not just claiming to be Christians on Facebook, but we're seeing the Spirit of yes. God move in our life. Yes. We're seeing ourselves actually react differently than maybe we would have a year ago. You ever been there before? Where you're like, man, last year, if you would have said that to me, Jesus, forget the Bible. I'll be using some other words, you know. And now we're seeing people's lives change where they're like, no, this is working. In John chapter 20, we read last week about Jesus raising from the dead and Mary walking right by him in the garden. And you remember this? She thought that he was a gardener. And she's like, just tell me where Jesus is. And he's like, hello. And a lot of times we get caught up in missing out what we need because it's right in front of us. And so let me give you some context about John 20, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, this is what we know so far about the story. Jesus has died. He dies, he is crucified, and we have not seen him. Okay, earlier we know that he is no longer in the tomb. We see him encounter Mary, but you got to remember the disciples have not seen him. Secondly, Jesus has been seen by Mary of Magdala. And Mary of Magdala is probably the proper terminology. Mary of Magdala is the first person to encounter the risen Lord. And uh, we love that. We think that's incredible that God would share his resurrection story with a woman, first of all, but one that has probably not lived the best life up until her point. And then thirdly, we know that Jesus is now revealing himself to the disciples. As we continue in the story, we're going to see Jesus start popping up, resurrected Jesus, and encountering the people that he once did life with. The Bible says the disciples are locked away in a room for fear of the Jews. That's what the text tells us. The Bible literally says that they were afraid that the Jews were coming for them next. And let's be honest, that's how it ought to feel. If you have allegiance to Jesus in good times, you ought to have allegiance to Jesus in bad times too. So the disciples are locked away and it says that Jesus appears among them. So when I get to heaven, I want to talk to Peter. And, you know, I want to talk to Thomas. I want to know what was this moment like? Because we don't see the door opening. We see him just appearing. He just walks through the walls. I don't know. He's God. You know what I mean? Above my pay grade and not. But it shows you something that even when you try to keep God out, he has a way of still getting in. You ever felt like you tried to shut the door on God before? I'm never going to another church again in my life. I'm never going to trust somebody again. After that, I'm not going to do it. And still, God appears to you and has these ways of drawing you closer to who he is. The text says that Jesus reveals himself. Someone say reveal. It's, it's, revelation is important in any Christian's life. When something is revealed, it means that it has always been there. This iPad has always been here. But until you actually see it, it's not a revelation. Are you with me? Can't see the iPad now? Now it's a revelation. There are same things in your life that God wants to reveal to you. 
But sometimes he wants to know how far are you willing to come until I reveal it. Uh, Revelation is transformational by nature. Some people say epiphany. I had an epiphany. It's deeper than an epiphany. It's something in your spirit that says, I see it now. It makes sense now why I went through that. It makes sense now why I'm in this stage right here, right now. Revelation kind of opens our eyes to what God's actually doing. Now, let me just be a pastor here for a second. God will not reveal something to you that is out of alignment with the Bible. God is not going to reveal something to you that he already hasn't said in Scripture. So when I was a youth pastor, I used to hear this all the time. Pastor Billy, how you doing? What's going on, man? How's your life? You doing well? Yeah, you know, me and my girlfriend, we moved in together and, you know, things are going great. And I'm like, okay, don't worry. God told me it's okay. Okay, based on what scripture? Because if we're going to be Christians that actually live the full life, we got to recognize the Bible's made things clear. God's not going to speak something he hasn't already spoken. (laughs) Am I helping anybody here? Because I get a lot of people today that want a relationship with God, but only want to hear him say the things that they want to hear. We believe in sola scriptura, which means it's only on scripture that we find true faith. But we also believe in toda scriptura, which means we believe all of the scriptures. So you can't cherry pick and say, I like what Jesus said about marriage, but I don't like what he said about sin. So I'm just going to take that out and only believe this part. And so as Christians, we're constantly going deeper to try to understand a revelation of who he is. Revelation is what gets me up in the morning. The reason why I'm excited to pray and read my Bible or declare the promises of God over our people at gospel is because I know that as I call on his name, he's revealing something. That's why worship, you ought to never be late for worship. You ought to never stay quiet during worship because when we sing to God, we're telling him who he is because we want him to reveal something. And I just learned this. Uh, uh, There's a new age movement that says, well, God is who you are. So if you discover who you are, you'll discover who God is. Eh. Just flip that the other way. Discover who God is, and then you'll discover who you are. Discover what he says, how he formed us, how he made us, and then you'll discover who you are. But we will find empty and vain identities when we try to concoct God the way we want him to be. That's an idol. That's not a God. If you're following a Jesus that never disagrees with you, you might not be following the real Jesus. Hello, I I talked to him today, and I'm like, whoa, am I off here, Lord? And I felt like, you know, the Lord reminded me, like, yeah, you you can still be wrong. Doesn't matter how long you've been following me. It's not about how long you follow me. It's how moldable and willing you are to grow. And so you can be a Christian in this room for 50 years or five minutes. It's all about your willingness to be closer to who he is. To have a revelation of who he is. Revelation is deeper. Than we think. Can I show you scripture on this? Matthew chapter 16. Let's go there real quick. Uh, This is an interesting passage of scripture because Jesus is hanging out in Caesarea Philippi, is what the Bible tells us. And don't worry, I did the background research on Caesarea Philippi. This would have been an area where people would worship their other idols. People would come down to where this conversation we're about to read is happening, and they would sacrifice to their gods and their idols right in this area. So one day Jesus is walking by with his disciples and he sees everyone else doing this stuff. And he goes, who do men say that I am? Because I see other people worshiping other gods, but what are they saying about me? And some of the disciples go, well, some people think you're like Jeremiah. Some people think like you're a prophet from years ago. And, And he goes, okay, so who do you say I am? Because if they're confused out there, we must be confused in here. Like how are people out there going to encounter the gospel if the church doesn't get it first? So he says, who are you? And let's pick it up. Verse 16, this is what uh, Simon Peter says. Simon Peter replied and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Revelation, right? He's like, you're not just a teacher. You're not just Jeremiah. You're not just a prophet. He goes, you are God. That's a revelation. You don't get that unless the spirit reveals that to you. There's people in this room today, you might be sitting next to somebody, and you're both going to hear the same message. You're both going to hear the same three points I'm about to give. But the Holy Spirit is the one that makes it real or not. So he says, you're God. And look what Jesus says, verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Barjona, that's just a terminology for son of. So Simon's dad, his name was Jonah. So Simon, son of Jonah. He says, Simon Barjona, blessed are you, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this. This revelation came from my Father who is in heaven. 
Jesus knew that Peter had just tapped into something divine. He knew just by confessing Jesus as Lord, that's a very weighty statement. And Jesus says, this isn't just an epiphany. He goes, you got this straight from heaven. I love how he says, blessed are you, because there's a blessing attached to revelation. When God reveals something, it's for you to be blessed and understand him more and understand how to get through life a little bit better. Let's keep going. Uh, Revelation gets difficult when we don't see what we like to see, though. Deuteronomy chapter 29 says it like this. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord. What does that mean? What are the secret things? Like the exact amount of days that you're going to live? God knows that. And that's secret. Or like how things turned out in your marriage or your first marriage or something went on. And it's easy to try to go, why did this happen? Why did this happen? The secret things belong to the Lord. He knows. He knows. So look what it says. The secret things belong to the Lord so we can just beat it out of him until he gives us the answers we want. It doesn't say that. The writer of this particular verse says the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that are what? Revealed belong to us. So not only is there a blessing attached to getting a revelation, Deuteronomy says there's ownership attached to revelation. That when God reveals something, it's so that you may do all the words of this law. So God doesn't just reveal something to us so that we can be really spiritual. You know, I have friends in certain camps of Christianity that they are like spirit all the time. Like, like, what do you want to do for lunch today? Well, let's pray. Okay, <laughs> what are we praying for? Like, and, and there's some people that it's like, they have these revelations of life, these revelations, but it doesn't go anywhere. It's like, oh, I got a revelation about why 2020 happened. Okay, is it going to help you do something about it? Or is it just so that you can say, look what I know? Because knowledge puffs up. But the Spirit wants to use us in everyday life. Are you with me? When I first came here to plant a church, I started telling our teams, I said, hey, I'm going to be the type of pastor that raises up leaders and empowers leaders. So, so I'll go to the hospitals and I'll pray for people, you know, when they're sick. I don't mind it at all. But I know that God's put it on people's hearts here that have a burden for intercessory prayer and for healing prayer. And so so as a leader, I want to empower that person so they can live that out. Because fulfillment comes not when we hear someone talk. Fulfillment comes when we get a revelation of those words and apply them in our lives. Um, I want to just take a couple things here uh, about secret things and and just how to get a revelation. Because I think some of us in the room today, we're unsatisfied with our faith because it's just kind of been like going through the motion. There's been no like newness or there's been no moment where you're like, wow, I see it now. Uh, Because revelation is important to propel us into the future that God has for us. Proverbs chapter 25 says this, and then we'll jump into a few points today. It says, it is the glory of God to conceal things. But it is the glory of kings to search things out. So this all has to do with Revelation. The writer of Proverbs says, God's glory, this word in the Hebrew is kavod, and this means weighty, it means heavy, and glory is like the weight of who he is. Proverbs says, God is who he is because he knows things that we don't. Our job is not to find out the things that he knows that we don't know. Our job is to continue to search out those things he's revealed. And so as we continue today, I believe that God wants to reveal himself. Not just, not just God, that idea of God, but I think Jesus wants to reveal something to us today in three different areas of our life. And I think that you are truly living out a life after Jesus, a pursuit of Jesus, when he's revealed in these three areas of your life. You want to know if your Christianity is meaningful? Find out if these three areas Jesus is being revealed in your life. So three, three ways that I need Jesus revealed in my life. Number one, I need him revealed in my heart. I need the goodness of who God is to be revealed in my heart. The heart is the seat of your emotions. Your heart is where it actually is, like how you're actually doing. Um, Jeremiah tells us something a little alarming about the heart. And I, I want to give it to you. Verse seven, uh, chapter 17 and verse 9 says it like this. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. 
So I need Jesus revealed in my heart. Why? Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful. Now, this doesn't mean like, oh, you should beat yourself up because you're a wicked person. And, you know, I've met some Christians, they think verses like this means, well, I just, I'm nothing without G. I just am the worst. And unless he comes, I'm just going to be the worst. And, and it shouldn't, like, make us put our heads down. But it should remind us that our natural inclinations usually aren't the best thing for us. That typically, as good as you think your heart is, Jeremiah tells us that flesh nature in you, it's deceitful. It'll have you doing something just to manipulate somebody, and then you'll say, why did I do this? It's because your heart, the flesh, goes after what it wants. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And look at this next verse. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. God says your heart is wicked and deceitful, but I'm not afraid of it. Your heart has easily gone sideways in the past, but I still want to use you. Isn't that wild? Anybody else think about this? God knows everything about you, and he still wants to use you. God knows everything about you. Your boss doesn't know everything about you. And if they did, they might not want to use you. But we serve a God that isn't pushed away by our sin. He says, bring it close. Let me deal with it and then teach you a way of holiness and a way to walk now in the power of who I am. I need Jesus first revealed in my heart. The Holy Spirit has to make him real in our hearts before anything else. You ever had somebody try to like rationalize Jesus or try to like think about it? And they're like, I just can't process it. Well, you're starting with the head when you should be starting with the heart. Because not only do we need Jesus revealed in our hearts, but we need to know that when he is revealed, it's to change us and to bring us into who we've always been designed to be. The heart is deceitful above all things. And our hearts have a big way in how we live life and how we treat people. Um, I like to say the way you treat others is usually an indication of how you think God treats you. Let me say that again. Uh, This is my view, at least. The way that you treat others is usually a picture of how you think God treats you. And if you're not treating others like that, you might want to think, well, how does God treat me? And how do I now treat others? That's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. The way that God blesses you, are you willing to bless others? The way that God speaks to you, the way that God is patient with you, are you willing to be patient with others? The way that God forgives you, are you willing to forgive others? The way that God focuses on the main thing, like we need to judge people not by what they do, by, but, why, by, but by what they've been through. I don't want to judge somebody's words. I want to see the pain and understand they went through something that made these words. And we can work backwards from that. Deuteronomy 30, let me give you one more here. It says, the Lord your God will change your heart and the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart, your soul, and that you may live. Change is a part of following Jesus. If there is not change in our life, then we might need to adjust things in our life. I'm always wanting to be more like him and try to go after who he is. That's the cry of a Christian. Do we get it right all the time? Probably not. Do we all have room to grow? Absolutely. But Deuteronomy says he wants to change our hearts. So I need Jesus revealed in my heart. Secondly, I need Jesus revealed in my head. So I get the heart change. Now I got to get him revealed in my head. I have to start processing some of the things that he claims. Okay, once you understand and believe him and it's not a question of what he's real or anymore, then you got to start wrapping your mind around how to follow him. And what are the steps I need to take? What are the disciplines I need to implement into my life? Um, Luke chapter 24 tells a story about Jesus revealing himself after his resurrection. The Bible says he resurrects and uh, there's these two guys walking on the road. We pick it up in chapter 24, verse 13. And it says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. They were talking about the resurrection, not the resurrection. They were talking about the crucifixion. They were talking about, did you hear this guy, Jesus? He claimed to be the Messiah. He died. He said he was going to raise. Now everybody's worried. No one knows what's going on. Verse 15 says, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So these two guys are walking, and they're talking about what happened, and Jesus just shows up, starts walking with them. And he's asking them questions. What are you guys talking about? 
they said, oh, are you the only one in Jerusalem that hasn't heard? Jesus, the claimed Messiah, he died and he hasn't resurrected. Now everyone's worried and they don't see that Jesus is walking with them. Who am I speaking to today? Have you noticed that Jesus is walking with you? Because sometimes we're so focused on the emotion of the moment. He died. He didn't resurrect. We don't see that he's actually right with us. It says he was walking with them and eventually he reveals himself. Verse 27, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. So he's walking with them and, and, and they go, wait, you're different. And the Bible, this is all it says, that he took Moses, he took all the Old Testament, and he showed them in all the places, the Old Testament, where he was prophesied he would come. What is he doing? He's trying to wrap their heads around this. Hey guys, I'm the same guy Isaiah talked about 700 years ago. I'm the same guy that John the Baptist talked about just a few years ago when he came baptizing. Let me get you to recognize this. I am the Savior. I'm the one that's come. Wrap your head around it. Are you always going to? No, it's beyond our comprehension. But I need Jesus revealed in the way I think just as much as I need him revealed in the way I feel. Are you with me? You want to change your life? Start changing your thoughts. You want to change your thoughts? Get something healthy to attach them to. That's a, that could be a diagram right there. You know what I mean? Like that's the reality, friends. We need to get our heads on the right thing. I've had to cut things out of my life. All my social media apps, they got like 10 minute timers. Because if I just spend too much time looking at everybody else's life, I don't focus on my own. If I celebrate everybody else and forget about the people in my own house that I haven't celebrated, so we just have to put things in the right perspective. We need Jesus revealed in our head. We need our thoughts to be like his. Um, but not only should he be in our heart and in our head, but lastly, as I close, number three, we need Jesus revealed in our hands. So I need him in my heart. I need him in my head. I need to align my thoughts with him. But now I need him revealed in the way I use my hands. So just to recap, I need him in my heart. I need him to change me from the inside out. And I need him to change my thoughts, my habits, the things that I think are actually helping me. I need to maybe change my thought on that. But all of that is nothing unless he's being revealed in what I do in my life. Um, let me give you a couple other scriptures here and, and just remind you that the truth of God's word is what empowers us to live for Jesus. That the Bible is not a historical document that we should memorize and, and know it's something that it's a playbook. It's something we can utilize right here, right now. There are promises that God has spoken over your life. You know, the Bible is full of about 7,000 promises. Promises that the eternal God has made about you and about me. Promises that he promises to be with us wherever we go. Promises that he promises to be close when everyone else is running away. We need them revealed in our hearts. Let's go to John chapter 21. And I, I want to encourage uh, everyone watching online to be prepared for this moment as well. John chapter 21 is after John chapter 20. <laughs> so make sure you're still here. And uh, Jesus reveals, his, reveals himself to the disciples. We just read about it in the locked room. Uh, he has an encounter with Thomas. And I don't have time to go into Thomas, but Thomas was doubting Jesus. And he says, unless I can... Stick my finger in his scars. I will not believe. So when Jesus shows up, naturally he comes up. In the text we read it earlier, it says he showed him their, his hands. And he shows his side. Because after he would have died, the Roman soldier would have pierced his side. You remember this? And water and blood comes out. It's the picture of the new covenant. It's water, salvation. The blood that pays for that. There's this awesome moment. And so he shows his scars to validate who he is. Never be afraid to show someone your scars. Never be afraid to show somebody what you went through because we are more connected by our pain than we are by our successes. And I think success is awesome and we're going to celebrate when people are successful. But don't tell me we all connect during success because some of us don't have it. What we do connect through is our pain. Jesus says, here's my scars. This is who I am. And then we go into John chapter 21. The disciples go fishing. 
And we pick it up in verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Are you seeing a pattern here? He has not been revealed all at once. He's going around revealing himself piece by piece to people. He says they didn't know it was him. And Jesus said to them, children, I love that, children. He's not addressing their age. He's addressing their actions. They're going back to fishing. You spent three and a half years with Jesus. He empowered you with his spirit. He breathed the Holy Ghost on you. You know exactly what you need to do. Go baptize people and teach them to be discipled. And you want to go back and go fishing. What a conundrum. You ever been there before? God's calling you forward and you keep going backwards. So it makes sense they didn't catch any fish. <laughs> it says he's standing at the shore. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they said, no. He said, cast your net on the right side, on the right side of the boat, and you'll be able to find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. They had the right supplies. Their hands were doing the right things, just in the wrong place. They were throwing their nets. They were utilizing their lives, trying to bring fish, but it was just on the wrong side of the boat. What's the principle? God has given each of us gifts to use for his glory. But until our gifts are primarily being utilized for his kingdom, we're not going to see the results. Jesus says, you want me to be revealed? Take that same gift you have and start using it on the other side of life. Stop building up your own kingdom. Start using it to build others. Stop just trying to keep, keep, keep and start giving, giving, giving. Stop saying, you know, me, me, me and start focusing on others, others, others. Jesus says, do the same thing. Just do it on the other side. What I've noticed about God is what Hudson Taylor says. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. That as long as we are asking Jesus to be revealed through our hands and we are doing it his way, we're never going to lack the resources. We're never going to lack the people. We're never going to lack the momentum. I just got that kind of faith. I believe that God has done so much in the short time our church has started, but you best believe that I believe he's going to supply even more. I believe we haven't even seen the fullness of what he wants to do in Chautauqua County. It starts with days like today, getting baptized. If I could sum up what the church is all about, it's about saving souls from hell, from, from eternal darkness, from God, and it's about making disciples, helping people find meaning and purpose. And days like today are reminders that we are doing just that. Uh, there are 15, I think, people getting baptized today. And yeah, we can celebrate. Can we put our hands together? Immediately after service, um, we're going to be doing baptisms right in the parking lot here. And we would love to invite you to just join us. Um, you know, we're going to have some music on out there. If you want to stick around and watch, you can. If you came, maybe you're a family member, you came to watch someone get baptized, we'll have some stuff out there. But if you were one of those 15 people, uh, would you do me a favor, just stand up on your feet right now. If that was you, register to get baptized. Come on, church. Can we clap our hands? This is awesome. This is awesome. We love you guys. We celebrate this decision. Um, I'm going to ask you to come forward down to the altar if you don't mind. I just want to pray with you. Um, yep, grab your stuff if you want. Grab, grab everything because we're going we're gonna to send you to get changed right after this. Yep, just come right up here. Right up here. Spread across if you can. Uh, this is a sacred moment, y'all. Baptism is a day that we celebrate. Um, these individuals have professed faith in Jesus privately, but today in front of everyone, they're going to go underneath those waters and publicly tell the world, I am committing to following Jesus. We get baptized. Yeah, come on. We get baptized for a couple reasons. We get baptized because Jesus told us to. Uh, Jesus himself was baptized. We get baptized as a picture of our new life in Christ. So when, our when we go underneath the waters, it's a picture of leaving everything else behind and coming up and saying, I am new today in Christ Jesus. And we do it to commit to following him from this moment on. And so we as a church, it's the same as it was with Chase earlier. You know, we're going to surround you. We want to be here for you. You're not just doing this on emotions, but you're doing this because this is an important step in your relationship with God. 
And we want to honor that. Would you stand with me, church, as we get ready to pray for them? I wonder what it would be like to have Jesus revealed in your hands. I can speak for these people at the altar. Today's a decision where they say, I want God to be visibly seen in my life. And uh, I want to pray with them and bless them. But they're making decisions today because they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I wonder if there's a few maybe here today that didn't come prepared to be baptized, but you would say, you know what, I just have this sense in me that I'm supposed to do this. Baptism is not an emotional thing. Don't just say, I need a better day, so I'm going to get baptized. Baptism is not like, well, you know, my last church didn't do it, so I'm going to do it now. Like, baptism is something that God is revealing to you. Uh, that you need to be baptized. You need to be committed to following Jesus. Maybe you've worshipped other gods before. False gods. Today's the day to be cleansed of that. And say, I'm after Jesus now. So would you close your eyes for a moment, everyone in the crowd, as we get ready to pray. If you're here today and you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you do, and you feel like just something about this moment that you need, you need to get into this tank too. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand on the count of three. Your heart might be beating like crazy right now. It might not be. Maybe you were baptized already. This isn't for you, but you know that you need to take that step today. If there's anybody uh, that would like to do that on the count of three, would you lift your hand? One, two, three. Anybody wants to get baptized today? Come on, right here. One. Awesome. Would you come down and join us here at the altar? Come on, can we make some, make some noise right now? Wow. I'm telling you. Dakota, right? Dakota, been waiting too long. And there is such a gift on your life. There is such, God has brought you through some things in the past. And today marks a new day. Today is a day where everything that was becomes meaningful. And it was all pushing you to who you are today. I don't mean to embarrass you, but I almost see the clouds opening now. Things are going to start getting clearer. As a mom, things are going to get clearer. As a spouse, things are going to get clear. And we just believe you're taking the best step today. It's going to be incredible. Come on, stretch your hands, church. Father, we pray over each person taking that step today to be baptized. Thank you for new life over who they are. Thank you that this is a moment that you have been waiting for. Today, they commit to following you, but in front of their church family, they commit to a new life in Christ. So today, we bless them. We thank you for them today, who they are what they've done to get them to this point. We pray today would be a day they'd never forget. Today would mark them forever, God. So we bless them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for what this moment represents. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, church, would you say amen? Okay, here's what we're going to do. Can I get uh, our service coordinators? Come on down a little bit. Everyone here at the altar, you're going to go straight back and start getting changed. And so, church, you stay here for a second. Let's just thank God as they exit. Let's celebrate them. They're going to go get their T-shirts. We got a team out there ready to receive them. And we'll be out there with you guys about 10 minutes. Take your time. Oh, man, that's awesome, y'all. That's what it's all about. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, uh, before we dismiss, um, I want to say one thing, thank you for being a church that's about this stuff. Because like, we're not playing games with the devil anymore. Like, I'm not trying to just like have a nice church where everybody's comfortable. Like, I want people to keep coming in, lost people, broken people, sick people. Let's get them healed. Let's get them baptized. Let's get them in a small group. Because um, in my opinion, that's what the church should be about, reaching people. And so thank you just for, for being a part of this place and helping us with that. Second, uh, we are going to end with the time of giving. So on the way out, I love just to remind you, we will have an usher team. They'll be holding those black buckets with a G on it. If you'd like to give today, um, we just would love to give you a chance to do that. Uh, if you're new to church, no pressure. You know, we, we, we don't think the church wants your money. We think God wants your heart. And there's something about being generous. And so today, I just want to pray for your giving. On the way out, you can leave it in the bucket. And man, just about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll be out there. We're going to be baptizing people. It's going to be incredible. Uh, but let's pray and let's dismiss. Let's thank God for a great day in his house. Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you for what you did today, from our worship, what you were doing, to the word, and now to this moment where we get to see people take this step. 
Let us always be a church that's about saving souls and making disciples. I thank you for anyone watching online today. I thank you that even now your spirit's moving in where they are. And uh, if you're watching and you need to take a step in your life, we have team members ready to help you with that. And Father, I pray for each person here that you would bless them this week. Keep them above and not beneath. That they would see they are the head and not the tail. That they have been blessed to be a blessing. We pray for a great week in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a great rest of your day. God bless you as you give. And we'll see you outside for baptisms.